Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to Bent Cinema with our fantastic special movie correspondent, Mr. Nathan Box, is with us again. We are going to do the first time ever here on Left to Straight Podcast, a year in review on films. It's our first time that we've had a special correspondent like Nathan that really has gone all in with his amazing takes of movies over the years. Nathan, welcome back to Bent Cinema, my friend. How are we doing? I'm pretty great. Thanks for having me, Scott. Well, I appreciate getting to talk to you. You've done this a couple of times with our good friend Johnny over at the Queer Centric. I mean, movies is your thing. I appreciate you taking the time to give us a little bit of insight here on Left of Straight podcast. Let's start by what you thought of the year in film in general. Yeah, I I thought it, overall it was a, a fantastic year in cinema. Um, I had five or six films that I sort of thought uh, rose to the top and were uh, five star films. Not everything that I loved got nominated for an Oscar or Best Picture. That happens, but I, overall, I thought it was a fantastic year. I think we have a lot to be thankful for. Um, and then, sort of, just it felt like a big return to the cinema for sort of marquee films. You know, the year before, lots of people came back for like Top Gun, Maverick. But, nice. you know, we had this sort of gigantic thing that happened over this summer. We had this known property, Barbie, which was sort of this film I think many people were worried about whether it was going to be good or it was going to be a giant corporate advertisement. I don't think any of us knew that this thing was going to turn out to be just probably the best movie up, up ever to explain what the patriarchy is and why it is harmful to women. Um, so this, you know, this movie makes well over a billion dollars, but it opens on the same day as a Christopher Nolan film uh, who always gets butts and seats at the cinema for a three hour biopic uh, is astonishing. And then to have this movie also almost make a million dollars or a billion dollars is just a fascinating thing that happened this year at the cinema. But I also I also thought it was a really strong year for independent film. I think it was a strong year for animation. I think it was a strong year for sort of those other categories that usually fall below the line at the Oscars. I thought it was a strong year for acting. I just... I was really impressed with this year. It was It was hard to make choices, and I can't say that uh, every year. Some years are pretty easy. Well, I got to tell you, this was my first year being accepted into Galeca, or Gay and Lesbian Entertainment Critics Association. So it's the first time I really took it seriously. I've always had fun with the Oscars. Now it kind of felt like a job. And I appreciate you helping me navigate it over the past few months because we were getting screeners left, right, and center. And there's so much to watch. I don't know how these movie people have been able to do this year after year. Uh, but it has been amazing. And to pull back the curtain a little bit, we're recording this just a couple of days before the Academy Awards, so our picks may or may not jive. It'll kind of be interesting to see how we do afterwards um, and how our things kind of compare. But, yeah, uh, same thing. This is my first year kind of really paying attention to filmmaking and, and same, same kind of feeling. I was surprised at what Barbie brought to the game this year and how it was a game changer. And I really was able to enjoy – a lot of the independent films, because I don't see them that often, but they were being sent to me left, right, and center. So that was very interesting. Um, talk about, in general, to me, we've done this for a couple of years now, um, where we've added um, a bigger selection to the best picture. Where we've gone from five to ten. A couple of years into it now, what are your thoughts on that? And I think there's a new category for casting even coming next year. What are your thoughts on that as well? Yeah, I think the expansion to 10 films has done um, a really great service to uh, four audiences. It is getting them into theaters to see films that they may have missed otherwise. Um you know, when I go watch I these, so when the Oscar ballot comes Oscar out, ballot. I sort of 
that's what I that's I what know. I, that's what I'm doing for the next two months is trying to track all these films down <laughs> here in Seattle. I'm lucky we've got quite a few little indie movie theaters, but when I go to see them, you know, these screeners uh, or these showings are all almost full, and I know it's because these films. Uh, were nominated, you know, before the Oscars. I went to go see a film that's nominated in the uh, anim uh, the animated category. It's a fair. It's a film called Robot Dreams. It was only showing one night in Seattle, and it's the week of the Oscars. And the theater was, I would say, eighty ninety percent full. And without the nomination, and without people sort of determined to track these movies down i'm not sure that it would have ever gotten that sort of reception as far as you know the casting category uh, sag has been doing that for a while the screen actors guild i think it's time that the oscars does it as well there's actually another category that i would add to the oscars um i think stunt choreography needs an oscar an oscar category i mean we're just going to give it to tom cruise every year but it needs it needs its own category because that work is really hard, really technical. Um, it takes a lot of work to keep actors and the crew safe. And I think we need to tip our hat uh, to people that are doing that work. And, you know, we also probably need to think about, you know, I know there's there's another version of the the Academy Awards that we don't see, which is sort of the, for the more technical work. But, you know, great CGI work uh, also needs to be uh, awarded in some form or fashion because so many of these movies, even movies you wouldn't expect it, like Killers of the Flower Moon, have some CGI work in them. And I think these people need to be sort of recognized on a national stage. Right. And well, timing is saying that. I mean, we just had the trial this week of this prop master that got convicted uh, of, um, what was it? Um, yeah, it was the film Rust with. Uh, it was yeah, it was the film Rust. Baldwin. I'm trying to say it was like, it was not negligent homicide. It was like, un, it's where it's unintentional. Yeah. Someone gets killed. Monster. So they got convicted yeah. of that. And it just tells you how much, I mean, there's lots of rules involved and stunts and how things should be done and the safety of it at all. So I think you're right. I think the people that are behind the scenes on this and that do this, both the stunt performers themselves and people behind the scenes mapping them out and choreographing and everything deserve that accolade. So well said, I like that a lot. Um, Let's kind of, I was uh, very impressed with the overall LGBTQ-ness of the year. Um, lots of lots of great um, actors getting recognized, lots of good films with some portrayals in it. What do you think of the year in queer cinema overall or representation? How did that feel to you? Uh, I thought it was a great year for queer cinema. The, uh, you know, there were, there was, it felt like there was a larger, um, plethora of films to choose from i will say i think it is a damn shame that all of us strangers was not nominated at the oscars i think it is uh it's incredibly sad that andrew scott uh the lead actor in that film was not nominated um that movie is so beautifully written it is so beautifully acted and it is centered on a gay love story. And I just, I'm just thinking if that film had been nominated and sort of that, what we were talking about earlier, people had to go track down to watch this film. Um, I think I, I just the numbers that it could have done uh, and the number of people that could have been exposed to that story, I think would have been much higher. But Overall, I think it was a great year for uh, queer cinema. One of my one of my favorite films of the year is a movie that's on Hulu called Theater Camp. And if you know theater kids, if you were a theater kid yourself, uh, this movie is going to like sort of push all the right buttons. It's absolutely hilarious, but it being a theater camp, it's filled with lots of queer kids and. Um, 
every one of them is absolutely hilarious. Uh, the film Bottoms did really well. I saw a couple of films this w year that sort of uh, centered the trans experience, Mutt and Monica, that I would recommend people sort of uh, seek out and watch. They were both really powerful. So, yeah, overall, I, thought, I think it was a really powerful year for uh, queer cinema. There, I agree 100%. And I have to give my little critics association some kudos. We were the only organization, and there's only 500 of us. We're not huge. We're bigger than Hollywood Foreign Press, but a lot smaller than everyone that uh, votes in these things. But we were actually, we actually recognized that we, when we were strangers, we gave them best picture overall, best LGBTQ, LGBTQ picture. picture, and best screenplay by Aunt, by uh, Hate. So I was very proud of that. I also want to give a shout out because we were one of the only ones that recognized Greta Gerwig as best director, and she won best director. So a big shout out. I think it's nice that our queer representation and and uh, we can kind of pick out these things. It doesn't have to be a queer film, but we recognize good, strong work. And like you said, uh, Scott's performance was amazing. And uh, yeah, so I, I was happy Galeka got it right in a couple of those things. Now, we talk about all these films there is to see. I think you saw every one, but maybe one I tried to get you a trailer for and it didn't work out. Talk about that. Did you see everything? And what was the one that got away? Yeah, I, I've seen all, I've seen, 50, I saw 52 of the 53 films nominated. Um, the one that got away was nominated in the documentary category, and it was To Kill a Tiger. Uh, Netflix has purchased the rights to that film, so it will drop at some point in time. So when I get a little notification that's time to see it, uh, I will. You know, I don't think, in we're playing Monday morning quarterback and uh, recording this before the Oscars, but I don't, you know, the sort of above line films, I don't think they're going to be a lot of surprises. I think it's going to, I think we'll be sitting here thinking it was a very good night for Oppenheimer and it was a very good night for Christopher Nolan. I, I assume he's going to get his first Oscar and uh, that is perfectly okay with me. And that's sort of my choice, but yeah, uh, top to bottom, um, feature length films down to the shorts. I thought it was uh, a great year uh, for cinema year round or all around. And uh, there was just so much that I enjoyed. There was very little, um, there were very few films that were nominated that I just flat out didn't like. There's always a couple, but I, most of them I thought were average to above average to absolutely fantastic films that I think we're going to be talking about for a long time. Right. And I think it, we, we it kind of changes from year to year where there are some years where it's kind of like the, the prognosticators get it right. There's not going to be that many competitive categories. And there's some years where there's quite a few competitive categories. And I think this is one of those years where it doesn't seem like there's too many um, competitive that people aren't really expecting to come out. So it'll be fun to see if there's any surprises. But uh, I think you're, you're right on target there. Let's go through just a couple categories as far as best picture talk about what you're expecting to win what you wish would win and a film that you wish were nominated that wasn't oh great question uh i expect and i uh, my choice for best picture and i think the academy will also select will be is oppenheimer if it if the if Oppenheimer wasn't a thing this year, uh, Jonathan Glazer's film, The Zone of Interest, would probably be my choice. Um, it is a dark film, but I recommend people see it. It is about a uh, it is about a captain who is in charge of Auschwitz, and uh, while this film is happening. Uh, the mass genocide is happening over the prison walls. We don't ever see it. This family is going about their day. They're laughing with friends. They're sharing dinner. They're swimming in the pool. They're gardening. Meanwhile, uh, the mass murder of millions of Jews behind them is happening. And it is, it is a fascinating film. 
but I still think that um, I still think Oppenheimer is going to have a really good night, and I uh, will be completely happy with that choice. Um, I wish all of us strangers was nominated for best picture. I think it's really well done. I also wish that Godzilla minus one was nominated for more things. I, I think this is quite possibly the best Godzilla film to ever be created. And this is a character that we've been hanging around with for 70 years now. And this film is just so well done. And it's one of those things that you watch it and then you learn a little bit about the film that it was done on a $15 million budget, which is insane to me because they do things that look far better than sort of any of the Godzilla King Kong movies that we've had come out of Hollywood for the, the last decade. And I'm really hoping uh, more people see this film because it is so well done for a character that we know so much about. I'm glad you said that. I hope people will check that out because that, that's a very good recommendation. All right, let's go ahead and do the other top four. Uh, same kind of the thing for best director. Uh, who do you think will win? Who do you think should win? And what director do you think was kind of overlooked or do you think deserves some accolades? Yeah, directing was a stacked category this year. And... um I think Christopher Nolan will win. I think he deserves to win. I think that's who the Academy the Academy will select. Um, but I also agree with everyone else that Greta Gerwig should have been nominated in some form or fashion here. Um, not to take anything else away from the other nominees. I imagined... If we were sitting in that accounting office where all of the votes are sort of tabulated, we would have seen that Greta Gerwig was the sixth pick, and she just missed it by uh, probably a handful of votes is my guess. So it's just a really stacked year, but I just don't think we can overlook what it meant to have her as a director and a, a screenwriter of this film to take a known property that I think many of us were worried about whether this thing was going to be good or not and turn it into one of the top 10 films of, uh, of the year. I just, I think she should be recognized in some form or fashion. And just because of a stacked category, that's, that's how it worked out this year. Well said. Well, let's open up the acting categories. Yeah. I'll let you choose between best actress or best supporting actress. Um, let me know who you think uh, should win in either category that you prefer, that you thought were more interesting performances. Who do you think will win in that category? And who do you think might have been overlooked acting in general? Any actress that you think is an, an underrated actress overall? Yeah, so I see the actress race as the, uh, yeah, the actress race is probably the one spot uh, of the above line films nominated on Sunday night that may be the most competitive. I do think there are sort of two actresses who are uh, sort of ahead of everyone else. Uh, it will either be Lily Gladstone from Killers of the Flower Moon, or it will be Emma Stone from Poor Things. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I've had a hard time trying to figure out which performance I liked best. I think Emma Stone and Poor Things is slightly my favorite, but I do think the Academy will pick uh, Lily Gladstone, and I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, it is a damn shame that we haven't had more uh, first first Americans nominated uh, in any of these categories for the 96 years of the Oscars. And Sunday night is an opportunity to right a wrong. So uh, I I think that's that's what's going uh, going to happen. Um, sort of the 
actor, the lead actor race, I think is probably over. I think it's Killian Murphy and I uh, nominated in uh, Oppenheimer. That's my choice. That's who I think the Academy uh, will pick. Um, so yeah, in the lead actor uh, categories and actress categories, those are sort of where my mind is going. Right. Gotcha. Actor in a supporting role, I also think is probably uh, sewn up and that choice is pretty easy. I think that Robert Downey Jr. and Oppenheimer is also a fantastic choice. And seeing him in that role after more than a decade playing Tony Stark in Iron Man, I think many of us forgot that uh, Robert Downey Jr. can do this thing, that he has won an Oscar, that he would he played Charlie Chaplin. And um, sort that was of the seeing... most amazing movie. Chaplin was so well done in everything from the filmmaking to his acting was superb in that. Unbelievable. Yeah, sort of seeing him return to that world uh, is really, really uh, fascinating to me. And um yeah, I was just blown away by his performance, and I hope, I hope he is getting more roles like this in the future, and it allows him to sort of um, something to sink his teeth into and do this type of work. I really do. As far as an actor uh, or actress that I think that I wish was getting more attention, you know, he's been nominated before um and he's nominated this year but you know i'm just sort of i was sort of watching barbie i was blown away how funny ryan gosling is and sort of how much range he has he has a film coming out this spring he's a stuntman and it's a comedy i'm really interested to see how that performs. I'm interested to see if any of those people that have come out of sort of the Marvel world or the DC world and are starting to make that transition. I'm interested to see if any of those people will start to take on serious roles. I'm thinking like Chris Evans or, you know, those type of people. Right. I want to see them um, sort of spread their wings and, um, exercise their acting chops a little bit and um, sort of follow the Robert Downey path here. I think those are some great choices as well. And I think people forget uh, about Ryan being back in Mickey Mouse Club type days and things of like that. He had that kind of a camp kind of as starting out, right? Uh, right. So very, very funny, but I agree 100% on that. And let's talk about overall, I mean, academies every year have their, their governor award, and I forget, the Thalberg or whoever, whatever that award is. Who do you think this year deserves um, to, get, to get recognized just overall film um, achievement and greatness in film? Who is your overall favorite right now? Yeah, I, I think he will be recognized in the – director's category and i think you know he was just recognized by the sundance the sundance institute i think we've probably sort of taken for granted what someone like christopher nolan has done over his 10 films uh i think 10 films so far and that they've all been such wildly different stories and but they've all just been uh, big box office hits, and they have some of them have been challenging films. But he sort of has this commitment to, you know, doing stunts the old-fashioned way and not trying to use CGI, and you know, has sort of this reputation for a very disciplined set. And actors and actresses are really sort of. Um, really excited to work with him and sort of waiting for the call that they want to be in a Christopher Nolan film. So I think, you know, he deserves uh, some recognition. I think he has a long 
career ahead of him. I hear that he's interested in doing a couple of James Bond movies, which I think would be fantastic and sort of the shot in the arm that the franchise needs. But I think, I think we need to sort of pause and think about what this individual has brought to the cinema for the last uh, two plus decades and uh, sort of tip our hat to what he's accomplished. Nice choice. I like that. Well, let's wrap up uh, looking into the future here a bit. How do you think, A, the actors and writers strikes may affect next year's films, if at all? And what do you see any trends or anything happening for next year? What you, is there anything you're looking forward to that you know about and any trends that you're looking forward to or are not happy about? Yeah. You know, I was I'm in a film club here in Seattle and we get together as a large group uh, once a month at Seattle International Film Festival's theater. And we watch a movie and then we go over to a beer hall afterwards and we sort of dissect the movie we watch. But we also just spend a lot of time talking about movies. And we were sort of talking about Seattle's upcoming International Film Festival, which is in May and it'll be the 50th anniversary. And it's really exciting. But sort of the selection process of films uh, was happening during the writers and actors strike. So I'm sort of operating under the assumption that we're going to get a sort of a large selection of films over the next six months that will be indie films and they will be international films. Um, you know, studios or distributors like A24 we're very quick to um, sign on with the writers and actors strikes to meet their demands and get back to filming. Right. And it was the big studios like Warner brothers and Disney who were resistant to their demands. And so we, now we've got this gap and uh, I think we're going, it's not going to be, a, it's not going to be another Barbenheimer Heimer summer. Um, but I think the fall should be pretty busy uh, for those sort of bigger films. But yeah, I think it's going to be a big year for indies and, and international films, which for me is really exciting. I am nervous and it just not, this isn't just about Hollywood, but this is about, you know, the work I do in my real life. What is the rise of artificial intelligence going to mean? What are we are going at some point in time in the future, you and I are going to be sitting here talking about or reviewing a film that was created 100% based on AI. Every image of it was AI, all movement, all acting was AI. It was written by AI and we're going to have to deal with that. And what does that mean for this art form? What does it mean for the industry as a whole? You know, the actors and writers really uh, lessened the hold that AI can have in this current contract, but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean the next time that it will be the same. And at some point in time, the studios are going to start asking themselves a question, uh, which is cheaper? And that's going to be scary for the world of human expression. And that's what this art form is. And AI sort of just terrifies me and we deeply need some regulation around what it can and can't do uh, but looking to washington dc i don't expect that to happen anytime soon right well said i just saw i don't even know what it's called maybe it starts with an m but i just saw a, a promotion for it for the one that chat uh gpt is putting together where they did the they did prompts for videos and like elephants walking and all of a sudden elephants are walking and it looks, you can't tell it's not elephants walking. And I forget what it's called, but it's going to be coming out very soon. So I agree a hundred percent. It's amazing what they can do. Well, I mean, stick around at the end of any Marvel movie and just look at that cascade of the num number of people, CGI artists that it takes to make a film. We're talking hundreds 
sometimes it feels like thousands of people to pull one of these films off. And if you are telling me that AI, one computer program, can do the work of a thousand people, okay, well, if I'm a studio exec, I'm, I, I'm automatically seeing the savings. But what do these thousand people do? Where do they work? Right. What do they do? How do they express themselves? We have lost something, and that is terrifying for me. So well said. I mean, the only thing we can hope for is it, it gets to the point where it's happened in the past, where all of a sudden individual people have to start doing things. We'll see a lot more independent projects using their own. I remember when there was an actor's glut, that's when actors started doing all their own web series and everything. So maybe as this technology comes together, we have the people that have been doing this all along. We'll start doing their own projects that even take it to the next level that AI can't do. Who knows? But you're right. I think it's something very scary to watch for. I think we might get to a world where we have like the return of United Artists, where directors and actors are coming together and forming their own thing, where like their own streaming channel, where it's 100 percent human created, uh, no AI. And I, I think that might be the way that we push back on that. I think we also need to realize like the the CGI artists at Disney have unionized and are starting to push back on this stuff. And if you love this work, uh, support their union. Very, very, very well said. Well, Nathan Box, thank you very much for helping us wrap up this year in movies. We look forward to having you every month. We get you twice a month, and I'm so grateful for it because I know you're so busy doing everything you do with everyone else in Seattle and your own website that's phenomenal. Remind everyone what that website is and where they can find you on social media, my friend. Yeah, uh, the website is NatheWorld.com, and my social media handle is the same thing, at NatheWorld. Fantastic. Guys, we're lucky enough to have Nate twice a month here. Be sure to look for Bent Cinema every time you see it pop up on your screens here. We are so proud at Left to Straight Podcast to have Nate uh, talking to us here. You guys have a fantastic week. I hope you're all looking forward to some great movies. Let us know how we did in the comments if uh, we were close to what we were what we were expecting there in some of the Oscar categories. And we will talk to you next time. You're listening to Left to Straight Podcast right here in the Left to Straight Podcast Network. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Bent Cinema here on the Left of Straight Podcast Network. Look for upcoming episodes with our special movie correspondent, Nathan Box, twice a month. If you have a specific film or movie question you would like Nathan to talk about on an upcoming podcast, please email us at bentcinema at leftofstraightpodcast.com. Have a great week and we'll see you at the cinema.